Okay. Welcome back to the second day of our boot camp. I hope you enjoyed the first day. And uh, if you have any questions, I will try to, please ask them, I will try to repeat them, but we just realized that we do have wireless mics, and uh, Roz Vaughn has them, and so if you, could, if you could ask questions in the mic, that'd be a great thing, then we could record the, you know, your version of the question as well as mine. So the first lecture of today is about the theme of patterns again, in the sense of, if you look at your simulation problem, and I'll say what simulation means, how do you recognize, oh, I've seen this thing before, I, I see how to find the parallelism, and not just the parallelism, but the locality, because in Kubi's lecture yesterday, he pointed out that the most expensive operation that a computer can perform is moving data, either between main memory, off chip, to cache, on memory, or between processors over a network, whatever, that is orders of magnitude more expensive than actually doing any arithmetic or logic on that data. And so, in order to parallelize things effectively, we have to worry about finding both parallelism and data locality, putting data that's going to be operated on close together. The good thing is that many real world problems have a lot of parallelism and locality. If you just look for it, it's right there. Why is that? Well, in the real world, many objects operate independently of one another. I mean, you're going to decide where to go to lunch, and you're going to decide where to go to lunch completely independently, and there's just a lot of that. And so we can have different processors for different objects. Also, you tend to depend on, objects tend to depend on nearby objects more than distant ones. That's both true socially, but also if you're uh, you know, doing a uh, van der Waals simulation, right? Things, particles that are close to you have a much larger influence than particles that are far away. That's a ubiquitous phenomenon. That will let us uh, exploit locality. And also, when things are far away, you're depend you may still depend on them, but the dependence gets simpler. And, and there are lots of good physical reasons and social reasons for that. And so, the, the, an example that illustrates all three very well, and I'll repeat uh, over time, is gravity. All the particles are moving independently under Newton's laws. Um, particles that are much closer to you obviously have a larger gravitational force on you. And particles that are far away, even though there are lots of them, you can simplify them. So when Newton watched the apple fall, he didn't write down a term, you know, he didn't write down the force term as the sum of the gravitational force between every rock in the Earth and the apple. You know, he had one term summarizing all the Earth's gravity, and if you apply that trick uh, systematically, which we will, then you can reduce the cost of gravitational force in n bodies from order n squared, everybody, help, everybody influences everybody else, to order n. There's, there are amazing speed ups that are possible algorithmically by taking advantage of that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll get to that, probably in, probably in tomorrow's lecture. I'll, I'll mention it briefly today. And the scientific models themselves introduce more parallelism because, of course, we have to write down a discrete system of equations to describe any real physical thing. So, for example, we're not going to come up with a continuous answer as a function of time. We're going to compute the answer where are the particles at time t equal 1, t equal 2, t equal 3, and that introduces more parallelism, more locality, because you know, what happens at time t equal 2 only depends on time t equals 1, and maybe not earlier. And, and, of course, many problems exhibit this parallelism at many levels. So there are four patterns that I'm going to sh walk you through in, in a sort of assorted order that come up over and over again. The simplest one is discrete event systems. The game of life goes back a long way. That's a homework assignment we use pretty often. The particles live or die on a mesh, depending on their neighbors. Manufacturing systems, you know, things moving through pipelines. Finance, circuits. And since games are always a good example, Pac-Man, right? It only depends on what's going on in your nearest neighbors. The next level up adds a level of continuity. It's called particle systems. So billiard balls bouncing around with one another, galaxy simulations under gravity, atoms uh, moving around again under force laws, uh, circuits. In this case, um, circuits simulated at the logic level, right, AND gates, OR gates, and then pinball particles bouncing around. The next level adds one more level of continuity. We call them lump systems. You might have had a class in ordinary differential equations or ODEs. Same idea. That comes up in structural mechanics, chemical kinetics, circuits, and the next level of gaming, Star Wars, The Force Unleashed. We'll hear more about that. And the final level would be where everything is continuous. And, and those are called partial differential equations. And they model all sorts of things. Uh, including finance, again, that comes up, you know, that's modeled in many ways. And finally, there's Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. So there's any given phenomenon can be uh, modeled at multiple levels. So circuits, I'll show you, you know, has uh, simulations at the discrete level. It's 
at the particle level, at the lump level, and at the continuous level, and depending on what your interest in circuits, you may simulate it in every different way. And the other interesting distinction I want to draw between two of these games, between Star Wars, The Force Unleashed, and Terminator 3, The Rise of the Machines, Star Wars was done at Berkeley, and Terminator 3 was done at Stanford. So you may imagine I'll use the uh, Star Wars as, a, as a more of a running example than the other one. But if you want to see a much more detailed paper on that particular example, there's a website at the bottom. But what we'll, we'll see more later. So just to give you a sample of circuits, here are many levels of circuit simulation from the most uh, discrete, simplest level, where one event is an instruction being executed, an add instruction, you know, a, a read instruction, and uh, the primitives there are, are instructions. And many people do simulation at that level. And so here's some names of common simulators that are done. But you might decide that instructions aren't good enough for you. You want to look at it at the cycle level, the next level of detail. It's still a discrete event system. Same ideas work. RTL, gates, switches, different simulators, but they're still all doing discrete event simulation. Finally, you get down to circuits. You decide, I really have to know the currents and the voltages at different points in it. In that case, you have to know about resistors and capacitors. And you get an ODE, and SPICE, which was invented here, is one of the standard packages for doing that. And finally, if you're a physicist and you want to, or you know, you're building you know, CMOS devices and you want to know where are the electrons at any given point of time, then of course that's a PDE, that's a continuous system. And so, but the patterns that are used to build all of these repeat themselves, which is why I'm going to show you the patterns at a high level. And so here they are again, just to repeat, I'm going to talk about discrete event systems where everything is discrete, the time and space. Particle systems, where the particles are lumps, they're discrete, but they're moving continuously in time, Newton's laws, something like that. Then more generally, lumped systems, where time is continuous. And then PDEs, and I'll try to identify the common problems and solutions for all of these. So I don't want to necessarily teach you all about ODEs and PDEs. There are lots of different backgrounds, even though the patterns are important. So on the website, for, we have a model problem where these things are all simplified in terms of sharks and fish swimming around. So there's sort of simple versions of many of these things. So there are rules for how the fish and the sharks you know, swim around, what happens when they get close to one another, who eats one another, forces, you know, currents in the ocean. And there's many different versions to illustrate all these different levels of simulation. We've implemented simple versions of it in many different programming languages. They're all on the web page, you know, sequentially in MATLAB, so you can just see what the basic mathematics is, but also pthreads, MPI, OpenMP, and there are even some ancient languages, CMF. Connection, between for, connection Machine Fortran. I mean, it's been dead for a long time, but we left it on the web page. Uh, and so you can see all, all of those things there. And your assignment this evening in the lab will be to use one or two of those to sort of walk through them in a language of your choice to see how to illustrate some of these patterns. And if you're uh, a teacher, then feel free to take any of the other assignments and use them in your own classes. OK. The other point I'm going to try to make as I illustrate all these patterns is to say, hey, how do you solve them? I'm, I'm not going to solve them today. But all of those basic computational patterns that I talked about yesterday very briefly, the seven dwarfs, they're all going to come up. The way we're going to solve you know, these lumped parameter systems is we'll say, hey, that is a sparse linear algebra problem. I won't go into more detail on it today. That's tomorrow. But I will say, this is where all of these seven patterns appear. Uh, to solve all of these simulation problems. And I'll, I'll point that out as I go. OK, so that's, that's sort of the summary of what we're going to do. So let's start with discrete event systems. Systems are represented as a finite set of variables. All the variables have a given value at each uh, time. You know, it's time t equal 1, t equal 2. That's called a state. And there is a transition rule, a function, that says how you update the state at time t plus 1 as a function of you know, the values at time t. There are two flavors. The system can be synchronous, in which case there's a common time step, and everybody takes a time step forward all at once, t equal 1, t equal 2. And there's also asynchronous, where large parts of the system may do nothing for a while until something arrives, an event arrives. Some other part of the system fires. You get a signal, and then you have to update yourself. You don't know when that's going to happen, and you don't want to waste a lot of time you know, simulating when you don't get any input changes. And the game of life, if you've heard of that, is, is, a, common, is, a, you know, is a classical example. There's a mesh. Each, the value at each mesh is, of cell is either alive or dead. There's a fish in it or not. And depending on how many neighbors are alive or dead, you are either alive or dead at the next stage. So this is a, a very classical problem. And so let me just say how we simulate that. 
as I said, every, the, the new value at every time step is you just get your, your eight neighbors and you have, compute a little function of, of those eight bits and you decide whether you're going to be alive or dead in the next one. So we're going to have two copies of the grid, the old one at time t, the new one at time t plus one, and we'll take the values at t and we'll update t plus one. And then we'll ping pong. We'll take t plus one, that'll be the input, and we'll write the output in the other one. So we only need two copies, right, to move forward. And we keep copying from one array to the other. And how are we going to parallelize that? Well, the natural technique is to take a big grid. So here, you know, think of this square as, as being, you know, a, representing the boundary of a very large grid, an n by n grid. Suppose I have nine processors. I'm simply going to carve it up into nine squares. I chose nine to be a perfect square. And each processor is going to get the grid cells that lie in its subsquare. And so the algorithm, quite simply, is going to be repeat until you're done. Compute locally. Take, uh, so processor three is going to update all of the grid cells that it, it can do internally that has all the data update. It can do that for everybody except those right on the boundary because they have to know some information that's in the neighbor. Then there's a, an operation called a barrier, which was mentioned yesterday. Everybody stops to make sure they're done. Then you have to exchange information with your neighbors, your north, south, east, and west neighbors, and then you finish, and then you repeat. And this is you know, a, a pattern that comes up over and over again, but there are a lot of decisions to make about how to do it well. And why is this good for parallelism? Well, everybody gets an equal chunk if each processor gets one-ninth of the data. But it's also good for locality because every processor can do most of its work just because it owns all the neighbors. If you pick a, uh, you know, a, a, a mesh point in the middle of this, it needs its, you know, its, its neighbors around it. They're probably all locally stored. It's only right on the boundary that you might have to communicate, that you might have to do that expensive moving of data. So the question here is, here I chose subsquares, and it, it seems like a perfectly natural choice. but if I don't have a perfectly nice square array, how do I pick the shapes? How do I decide that processor one gets that subsquare if it's not all nice rectangles and squares? Okay, so let me just say, even when I have a nice rectangular, regular mesh like that, there's some decisions. So let me tell you why I chose squares, and that'll be my principle for doing totally irregular meshes. So here's my, let's say, 18 by 18 mesh. I want to, and so each point there where two lines cross is a, is, a, is a piece of data. I want to assign it to nine processors. One natural way to do it is to, is to divide it into nine block rows, so each colored rectangle is an assignment to a row. And the other natural way is the thing I had in the previous slide, is to do it by squares. And so they're both uh, natural, and maybe the one on the left looks easier to program. <laughs> the indexing and stuff would be easier. Which one is better? Well, the answer is which one has less communication? That's the answer. And so remember, you have to talk to your north, south, and east, and west neighbors. So you ask how many edges in that mesh go from one processor, one colored block, to a different colored block. And if you count them, they're quite a few, and it's proportional to n times p. The number of, it's an n by n mesh, so the number of mesh points along an edge times the number of processors. And the other one, little algebra, it's much smaller. It's n times the square root of p. That wins, right? We want something that's you know, as small as possible. As p grows, square root of p is smaller than p. And the general idea here is that even if it's not perfect squares and it's easy to see what's going on, the principle is we want to pick these domains so to minimize the surface to volume ratio. We want each domain to have as small a surface or perimeter in 2D as possible, you know, for, for as, as big a volume as possible. Okay. So now let's get a little less uh, regular than that and talk about circuit simulation. And in that case, it's not north, south, east, and west. It's whatever the circuit designer did, right? They, their wires going all over the place. And the, and the simulations are, you know, you have input wires, there are edges, and then you have output wires to, to go out. And we'll, we'll assume it's synchronous, so everybody's doing time stepping forward. And so the question is, I have this totally arbitrary, irregular graph, and I need to assign subsets of it to different processors to minimize the number of edges that go from one processor to another to minimize communication. How do I do it? Well, that's a classical problem called graph partitioning. And the, there, we have two goals. One is to make sure that everybody has about an equal amount of work to do, load balanced. Everybody has an equal number of vertices in the graph, which, which is where you do the work. And we want to minimize the number of edge crossings, the number of edges that go from one processor to another, which represent data, communication, moving along them, the expensive stuff. So here, at the bottom, I have, the, I have a very simple graph with eight red vertices. And I've divided it up in two different ways. And so you can look at that and say, well, which one is better? And the answer is count the number of edge crossings. 
The one on the left, there are six edges that go from one of those four processors. So here I've assigned, you know, this belongs to one processor, that belongs to another processor. There's two, four, six edge crossings. And this one, there are 10. Six beats 10, so that's the one you pick. Now, for a totally arbitrary graph, this problem is called NP-hard. And, and, and if you're a computer scientist, you know what that means. Um, it means that the best algorithm anybody has ever found for getting the best possible answer, totally minimizing communication, costs an exponential amount of work. You know, two to the n if you have n vertices. You're never going to do it. It's more expensive than the original problem. And so we have lots and lots of approximations. This is a well-studied problem. There, you know, don't, don't try to reinvent it here. By the way, did, have you been following the blog that somebody has claimed to prove that P does not equal NP? So I, nobody believes it anymore, but for a while there was a, about a week where people had thought there was actually a proof that this was exponential, but not now. Okay, so let me go on and continue to illustrate different flavors of this uh, load balancing and, and parallelization problem. So imagine that you're simulating sharks and fish, but they're in very loosely connected ponds. Maybe sharks and fish isn't the best example. You can imagine other situations like this where there's a lot of connectivity, a lot of action going on here, but there's a relatively limited possible influence of this pond on that pond. And so how am I going to divide this up? Well, I think it's pretty natural that you, you might say this is going to be a unit, this is going to be a unit, and I'm going to try to assign entire units to different processors so as to have everybody load balanced and, everybody, and, and the number of edges connecting are, are minimized. So this is, this is another example of sort of a, a sharks and fish version of the circuit simulation problem. So that's all synchronous. The next level of flavor of discrete event simulation is asynchronous. That's, that's more interesting. And the, the trouble with synchronous simulation is that you may waste a lot of time because nothing may change. Your, your neighbors may not change for a long time. You may get no inputs into your circuit. So why bother having a processor spinning to do that update? And so you only want to do an update when an event arrives from a neighbor. So there are no global time steps. The way you make progress is that every event has a time stamp that goes with it. There's some global timestamp. And so what you do is you, as soon as you get inputs from your neighbors with timestamps that are later than your current state, then you say, oh, it's time for me to take a step. And you move forward. And then you can send your updated output to all the, the other processors that it is going to influence. So circuit simulation with delays, because real circuits have delays, that's an example. And also traffic simulation. In that case, the events are cars changing lanes and, th and things like that. So it's pretty easy to imagine that synchronous Asynchronous is more efficient, but it's going to be harder to parallelize. That's a typical trade-off. And so in particular, with, we haven't talked about message passing yet, but imagine that your style of parallelism is that when, you want, when one processor communicates to another, it actually has to you know, send a message to that other processor. So if you are updating your data, it's perfectly natural. You send a message to your neighbors who need to know that new updated value. But how do they know when to check their mailboxes, right? How are they supposed to you know, do a receive of your data? Are they going to sit there spinning, look at their, looking at their inbox? That's not a good thing to do. So there's, there's various schemes people have to just update as little as possible. And there are two of those schemes that appear over and over again. One of them is called conservative, and the other is called speculative. And they have their pros and cons. In the conservative case, you only simulate up to and including the, late, the um, minimum timestamp of your input. So if your inputs are good up to time t equal 1, you are allowed to simulate up to time t equals 1, but you're not al allowed to go any further because you don't know if your inputs are going to change. The trouble with that is that you can have deadlock, and I'll give an example in the next slide. So you have to have sort of a way to escape deadlock when that happens. The other thing is to be optimistic and assume that your inputs aren't going to change for a long time and just keep simulating, just keep going, moving ahead and assuming that the inputs aren't going to change, the trouble with that is if you get ahead of yourself and you get some, an input that changed in the, in the past from your point of view, you have to back up. You have to have timestamps. You have to have sort of keep uh, some uh, information lying around extra space so you can back up and, and correct yourself. And there are simulators for circuits that, that do it both ways, as I, as I list here. So you can see that there are different challenges. So let me show you why you can have deadlock in the first one and how you fix it. So imagine that we have these three pawns represented by these three squares, and the pawns just sort of all go in a circle. And suppose that all the pawns have simulated themselves up to time t0, and they're waiting for an input. Who goes first? Right? That's the deadlock. Everybody's up to time t equals 0, 
and nobody can take the next step because they're all waiting in this cycle for, for, for a new input. So what is the answer? It's pretty primitive. What you do is if you're stuck for a while, you send a message anyway and say, are you stuck too? And if you get a message like that and you're stuck, you pass it on, right? And finally, if you get that message back that you send out that says, are you stuck too? You realize that there's a cycle where everybody's stuck and then you simulate ahead anyway. So the trouble with that, it works. The trouble with it is you get, it can be a bottleneck. You can imagine if you get deadlocks very often, you're gonna have to wait until this are you stuck message cycles around through all the processors and then you can move forward. So it can be a serial bottleneck. So that's why there are all these different ways of doing it. There is no one best answer depending on how the, the patterns of updates in your problem, one may be, you know, conservative might be better or optimistic might be better. So to summarize discrete event simulation, uh, everything is discrete, time and space is discrete. We're gonna decompose the domain, assign different domains to different processors, minimize the surface to volume ratio to minimize communication. And then we have to choose between synchronous, where, we, you know, where, where everybody's going time t equal one, t equal two, t equal three, or asynchronous, where you only communicate on demand when there's a change in the input, and then there's conservative versus speculative. So that's sort of the design space that comes up over and over again. Any questions about this? This is the level of pattern that I want to illustrate, right? So I'm not going to try to write, give you code for all this. If you look at the sharks and fish web page, there are sort of examples of it. I'm just trying to give you sort of the high level description. So are there, are there any questions before I go on to the next level of simulation, which is particle systems? Okay. So now on to particles. So we are going to have a finite number of particles in our system moving in space according usually to Newton's law, so F equals MA, everybody is sort of moving around and time is continuous. In the real world, time is continuous. Of course, we have to take discrete time steps, t equal one, t equal two. Lots and lots of examples. There's stars in space on, uh, under laws of gravity. There, I have lots of colleagues here in the astronomy department who do large scale simulations to ask how galaxies form certain patterns that way. I have colleagues in EECS who do electron beam uh, simulations of semiconductor manufacturing. You're aiming an electron beam to try to carve out certain circuits on the on a surface of a chip, and they do these kind of uh, simulations where, of course, there's electrostatic forces on all the little electrons you're shooting around. Uh, atoms and molecule again, electrostatic forces. Neutrons in a fission reactor, same problem. Uh, you know, no electrostatic forces anymore, but they do bounce off of various nuclei or get absorbed by various nuclei. Uh, cars on a freeway. Uh, with Newton's laws plus sort of a model of the driver and engine. So you sort of have this model of the psychology of a driver of when they put their foot on the brake. And so a car is a particle and it's not exactly, you know, a real physical law. It's an approximation of the person and the car. And then, of course, flying objects in a video game, which we'll see shortly. Um, and so, and of course, many simulations combine techniques that are both discrete event and, and some continuous. And the sharks and fish examples will, will illustrate that all for you. So it turns out, if you're doing a particle system, you can always see the following pattern. You can break the force down into three components, and we're gonna compute each force differently. So it, there's always an external force, a force that comes from nearby neighbors, that depends on where they are, and a force that depends on far field neighbors, everybody. So a typical example of an external force would be the um, uh, current in an ocean applied to sharks and fish, the sharks and fish have no influence in the ocean current. It's just that everybody feels it and they can all update in parallel. Um, if you have an externally imposed electric field on an electron beam, right, each electron feels that and that's, you know, everybody's independent. So nearby forces, that, and that's easy to parallelize. That's embarrassingly parallel. Nearby forces are, are sort of the next harder thing to do. In that case, it only depends on who your nearest neighbors are. And if you're a shark, you're attracted by nearby fish, you know, the ones that are far away you don't care about. Uh, collisions, if you're simulating bouncing balls, it's only when you are really close that there's actually, you have to do the physics of the collision to get that right. And uh, van der Waals forces, now that is an approximation of a chemical bond and it decreases as the distance to the sixth power. So as two of these you know, chemical objects get farther apart, the force between them decreases very rapidly, it doesn't go to zero, but one over r to the six goes to zero so fast that if you, you just put a threshold in and if it's far enough apart, you ignore it. And I have a colleague who simulates gecko feet because this is how they think geckos can sort of climb upside down on any kind of object because of van der Waals forces. 
And the most challenging one, and which has gotten several people elected to the National Academy in recent years for having new algorithms for doing this, is far field forces, where everybody depends on everybody, and you can't ignore anything. And gravity is a typical example, right? The, dis the, the gravitational force goes down like 1 over r squared, and you can't ignore anybody or you get the wrong answer. So gravity, electrostatics, radiosity, and graphics. And the amazing thing is it's possible, it, so it looks like everybody has to talk to everybody. It's going to cost you n squared if you have n particles. You can do it in order n by clever mathematics. So here is um, probably the only code I'll show you. It's the sharks and fish code in MATLAB, just to show you what the, uh, you know, what the time step update is. So, and, and all these particle simulations kind of look like this. So you have an array of, where, of the positions of where all the fish live. And this, this is working code. So this is an array of complex numbers. And a complex number you know, is an x comma y. So it gives you a position in the plane. You got an array of the velocities, same thing. You know, it's, a, it's an array of complex numbers saying, what's the velocity? You got an array of masses, because I have to do f equals ma. And you, we're going to simulate from time t equals 0 to time t final. And the algorithm is very simple, right? If I know the acceleration and the velocity, I can update the position. So just by taking a little time step. So I'm going to start at time t equals 0, and I'll take time steps initially of 0.01, just to start somewhere. And I'm going to loop over until I'm done, until t hits t final, update the time step, update the positions. You know, position is just current position plus time step times velocity, you know, simplest physics in the world. I have to compute the acceleration. That's the interesting part. That's where you know, I, I may have to do interesting you know, mathematics. And so depending on my position, I'm going to compute the force, which is the current in this case. And acceleration divided by mass gives me, um, force divided by mass gives me acceleration. I update the velocities by the same formula. And so I've taken a time step. The only thing that's a little bit tricky is that what is that time step? You know, how big a time step do I take? It kind of depends on how fast things are moving. If things are moving really fast, I have to take a tinier time step. And so what I do is I compute sort of the maximum distance that anybody could move. Uh, excuse me, I compute the maximum change to anybody's velocity. And if I change any velocity by more than 10%, I better make, take a smaller time step because it's too big. And so I have a formula where I, I basically have to compute the maximum of all the velocities and the maximum of all the accelerations. And so there, it's kind of a reduction. Everybody has to communicate a little bit at the end of that loop in order to decide the next time step. So this is a, a cartoon, but they all kind of look like this, all these simulations. So, le so let me now talk about you know, how we compute. Th this is where all the interesting work is, computing the forces. So, and I said there were three parts, so let me go back to the three parts. The easiest one is the external force where everybody, you know, nobody depends on anybody else. It's just the external current or, you know, the external uh, electrostatic field. It's embarrassingly parallel. And, and we had a name for this in, this in the, my pattern slide. It's called MapReduce. So map means embarrassingly parallel. Everybody computes the same function, maybe just depending on your position. And uh, any distribution of particles works as long as every processor has an equal number of particles. You're totally load balanced. And locality is irre irrelevant because there's no communication because everybody's updating independently. The only thing we need to do is do this reduction, like to compute a max, to compute the time step. So that's why it's kind of called map reduce. So that, this is easy. So the next thing is where you only depend on your nearest neighbors. So Easy exa easiest example to think of is billiards, right? It's only when you actually touch that you have a force from your neighbor. And the obvious and wrong algorithm is n squared. You take every pair of particles and ask, are you about to hit? I have to do something. That's clearly a waste of time. It's only when particles are very close together is it worth asking that question. So what we're going to do is use that same trick, domain decomposition. Suppose these are all the billiard balls on a square table. We'll break up the table into squares for the same reason we did before. And one processor is associated, you know, is responsible for the billiard balls in its subsquare. And it simulates those. And the only possibility of collision is for particles near the boundary. Right? These two guys might touch. And so what, what each processor has to do is just take the particles in a little boundary region it owns and exchange them with the neighbors. That's the only possibility where there could be a collision that requires communication. Otherwise, for stuff in here, the pro that processor doesn't have to communicate. These two guys that test, are you close enough to the collision? These two guys might collide. They're in different processors. Communication is required. But only that little blue region, that small surface-to-volume ratio, is the only communication that's necessary. 
So it's, it's the same idea we had for discrete event. Here it shows up in this, in this particle method too. So th that is, what do we do about processors near the boundary? And, and this, was, this picture I drew, and it was perfectly natural, I was, but I had an assumption that all the particles are uniformly distributed. So if I divided up my region into uh, you know, equal size squares, each processor would have about the same amount of work to do. It would be load balanced. That's not necessarily true. I mean, in real simulations, particles tend to cluster for one reason or another. And so we need to have a different scheme for d dividing up the region so that each processor has an equal amount of work to do, but we still try to minimize communication. And the standard trick is illustrated by this picture. This is called a quad tree in two dimensions, and I won't try to draw the three-dimensional one. It's called an oct tree. So I'm going to take my original domain, and I'm going to divide it into four subsquares. And I will, so, and that's, you know, so here are these, these four big squares in these four corners. And if that square doesn't have very many particles in it, I'll stop. So one processor will get assigned to that one. It has enough work to do. This one has lots of particles in it. I'm going to divide it again. I'm just going to apply the same idea recursively, dividing it into smaller squares as long as there's enough work left to do. And finally, and, and some squares will be empty, and, and some will, but I'm going to keep on going until everybody has about an equal amount of work to do. And that's the good way to do the load balancing. And we're going to use this picture for other things too, but the, these oct trees and quad trees are a common pattern. And, fi and so finally the hard part, which is where everybody depends on everybody, and what are we going to do about it? And so the easiest thing you could imagine, so gravity, uh, protein folding, you know, one over R squared laws, everybody depends on everybody. And the simplest way to do it is that eventually every particle has to talk to every other particle. If you have n of them, it's n squared work. And if you look at sharks and fish examples, there's some code for doing that. So just, just to give you a, a sense of what it looks like. And, and all of this code uh, has the same kind of pattern. You keep two copies of all the particles. And so if I here have five pro processors, each processor will get one-fifth of the particles. They compute all of the interactions between the things that they store locally, so no communication yet. And then what everybody does is it takes a copy of their particles and ships it to their processor to the right. He takes a copy of his particles, ships it to his processor to the right. Round robin. Now everybody knows all their particles to the right. They do the same thing. They compute all the particle interactions. Then you ship it all to the right, ship it all to the right. So you just sort of alternate, take all the copies, ship it to the right, and finally everybody has visited everybody, and you're done. But that costs n squared, and we don't want to spend n squared. I mean, so if, you have a, if, you, if you have to do it this way because the algorithm I'm about to tell you you can't make it work, well, this is how you do it. But we can actually, for quite a few forces, gravity, electrostatics, basically anything that's governed by, let me just say, an elliptic partial differential equation. If you, if you don't know about that, just think gravity and electrostatics. You can get the cost down from n squared to order n, or order n log n. And, there are two appro and this is doing an approximation. We're not going to get the answer exactly. You have to choose how much accuracy you want. Maybe you are, you're happy with three digits, or maybe you're happy with 15 digits, which is all that's in the machine anyway, right? So an approximation that's good to 15 digits, you can't tell the difference between that and doing the n-squared algorithm anyway. There are two ways people have thought about doing this, particle mesh and tree codes. So let me just uh, give you this one slide summary of it all. In particle mesh, what you do is here's all the particles, and what I'm going to do is approximate them by moving them to the nearest grid point. So I'm going to, I'm going to take these particles, and I'm going to push that one to that nearest grid point, that one to that nearest grid point, and I'm going to say it's good enough to approximate the original set of particles by these new ones, which are just sitting on these regularly spaced places. What good is that? It turns out you can use the fast Fourier transform to solve the problem in n log n if they're all sitting on equally spaced points. So. I won't say exactly how to do that, but that's a pattern that people like. Obviously, n log n beats n squared. The other way to do it is to use this picture that I had before, where I build this quad tree. And so, but, what, but I still have n squared particles. But here's the idea. If I'm sitting over here, and I want to know the force on these two guys from all the, uh, from all the particles over here, well, I can just replace all of these guys by a single particle at their center of mass and with the mass equal to the total mass. In other words, imagine that you're an astronomer, you want to compute the force in the Earth from all the stars in the galaxy, so you go out at night, you look up at the sky, 
and there are a lot of stars up there, right? And you're thinking, oh, I got to do a sum, you know, with one term in my sum for every dot up there. And then you suddenly realize that one of those dots you see is not a star, it's the Andromeda galaxy. It has a few billion dots inside it too. But then you say to yourself, it's perfectly good. The Andromeda galaxy it looks like a dot. I'm just going to have one term in my sum for that dot. And it turns out if you do that systematically, you can drop the entire cost from order n squared to order n. And this is called the fast multipole method. And the people who invented it became very famous because it applies to many, many different things. So that's a pattern that, that you should be aware of. But I won't say any more detail about it today. I might mention, say a little more about it tomorrow. OK, so that's it about particle systems. Are there any questions before I go on to sort of the next level of s simulation? Which are lump systems, or ODEs. So many systems are approximated, again, by a finite list of things, a finite list of variables, but they're not particles anymore. And they're, they're all going to depend on maybe some neighbors, and, but they're also going to depend on a, one continuous parameter, which is typically time. So we have an ordinary differential equation. And the example that given I'm in an EECS department that comes most quickly to mind is a circuit. So I'm going to approximate my circuit, which is a bunch of wires connecting resistors and capacitors and transistors and anything else you want. So that's a graph. The edges in the graph are the wires. The vertices are connections between two or more wires. And along each edge, there's a property. It might have a resistor on it, a capacitor, whatever. And so I write down a bunch of equations that Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's laws, that describe how does you know, this current up depend on the, the current of all the neighbors, that sort of thing. You write it all down. You get a system of ordinary differential equations. And you might also have constraints. So one of Kirchhoff's laws says all the currents in has to be the sum of all the currents out. So that's an algebraic equation. There's no derivatives in it. Write it down anyway. Put it all together. And you get a system of differential and algebraic equations. And if you really want me to write it down, here it is. So if you're a double ECS kind of student, you've probably seen this before. This, is, this summarizes many classes. There are many simulation packages that do precisely this system. A is a huge sparse matrix, which simply says this wire is connected to that wire. It has ones and zeros in it to say who's connected to whom. Um, this is a, another big sparse matrix, within which, which is all the resistances in it. Wherever there's a resistor, it has a number. Otherwise, it's full of zeros. This is another big sparse matrix, which just has the capacitance values in it. Otherwise, it's full of zeros. And that has the inductances in it. These are the voltages at the vertices, the nodes, you know, where a bunch of wires come together. These are the currents that go along the wires. It's another big, long vector, because you have a big circuit. And this is all the voltage drops across all those wires. So you write it all down, and you write down all your favorite laws that you learn about in, you know, in your freshman uh, electrical engineering class. And you get this big system, big sparse system of ordinary differential equations. These are differential. These are algebraic. They, there's no derivatives in them. And this is what we want to solve. So the question is, what patterns come up over and over again once you write this thing down that will let us solve? And one more example, since we're actually in between two buildings, on that side of the electrical engineers, and on the other side of the civil engineers, they do the same thing, except their goal is earthquake simulation. And they build large uh, simulation packages. And, and one of the things that they've analyzed here, you may, you may remember this piece of freeway fell down in the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, I think it was. And so they've built, that motivated them, um, earthquakes in general motivate them to do this work. Uh, a big simulation package where you take a model of any structure, you want to ask, what's going to happen when there's an earthquake? And so in particular, uh, so, so here, here is the sort of linear algebra problem it turns into. So the question is, is this building going to fall down in an earthquake? So how do you answer that question? Well, you build a big sparse matrix, which describes this building. It, very similar to the one I had here. I mean, if you, cir circuits vibrate too. It's easier to think about buildings vibrating. And, and what when, you, when something can vibrate, it has certain frequencies it likes to vibrate at. It's natural modes of vibration. Those turn out to be the eigenvalues of this matrix. That's what eigenvalues are, modes of vibration. So what you can do is take this enormous matrix, and you can figure out what frequencies does it like to vibrate at. What do you do with that? Then you go to earthquake records. Earthquakes vibrate, too. If the earthquake vibrate, tends to vibrate at the same frequency that your building likes to vibrate, the building will go into resonance, and then it will fall down. So the safety of any building comes down to do its eigenvalues match those of earthquakes. And if they do, you better redesign it. So that's, that's what this software is for. So let me uh, 
give you one example here now, which is maybe more imminent. I'll just show a little piece of it. This won Best Paper Prize at, uh, at a conference on computer graphics. I'll just show a little bit of it. In 09, James O'Brien's a faculty member here. And I think it's sold about 6 million copies now on Xboxes. It does real-time parallel finite element simulation so that all of the stuff that you see flying around is being computed in real time by solving the ordinary differential equations that describe where it's going. And I'm, not, I'm just going to show you little bits of this. It's, you know, it's all on the uh, web page. And so you can sort of move around, and you know, this is real-time control. So depending on how you take your joystick and move it, it has to, you know, that's a new position or force in the differential equation. It has to solve it very, very quickly. And so let me, and it also has to do all the different materials that come up uh, correctly. So let me move up here to just the part I want to show. Different materials have to be simulated differently. So, for example, there's stone. And so here you can take your wand and decide you know, to go after Darth Vader or just make a mess in the room here. And so it has a particular finite element model in it. It knows how stone shatters. It has a different model for glass. But again, it's solving you know, real-time uh, ODEs. And this is... and. Uh, let me, also, let me move up a little now and show you just exactly... Oh, I'll, I'll let it do metal, too, just for a moment. Which, uh, of course, has slightly different properties. If you try, if you it kind of bends, right? So... <laughs> and it kind of closes, but it's a little bit bent. Okay, so I want to show you, actually, in a little bit more detail, what, I what are the equations? And I'm going to superimpose that on this image. OK, it comes up soon. Now, this is wood. Oops, sorry. OK, so it'll come up in about uh, 10 seconds. There's R2D2 smashing into some wood. Uh, and, of course, you can have hardwood or softwood. Okay, so now we're going to superimpose the actual equations on this picture. And you can see the mesh is not very uh, you know, fine, right? He's not getting every last little brick right. Yeah, you know, so, the, so the simulation is being done at, at a coarse level, and the graphics is being superimposed on top of it. And you can... Okay, so here's, here's what the equations look like. Now, you can also change the physics in real time. And so there's, gonna be, there's a little menu where you can change the Young's modulus, the Poisson ratio of all the materials in it. And so instead of having a brick wall, you can change it into a jello wall and continue with your simulation, right? So, but you know, all of this is sort of built in. And um, so depending on whether you're a gamester or whatever, then OK, let's stop with this. So you can look at that at your leisure. So, so being that this is a this was an Xbox 360, so I think that had like eight processors on it. But I mean, when you're a gaming company, you need to build it so that it's portable, and you get a different experience if you're on the latest NVIDIA GPU, which has you know hundreds of processors, and you can do a much finer physics simulation than if you're on your CPU, and it'll be kind of clunky, you know, your 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 dual processor laptop. But it runs on all these different platforms. But they were obviously concerned about the latest high performance machines. Okay. So what patterns are common in all of these? So in almost all, in all these cases, these matrices that I'm referring to that describe which pieces are connected to whoever else, they're all very sparse. So a sparse matrix is one where most of all the array entries are zero. And of course, we don't want to store those zeros and we don't want to compute on them. So what do the algorithms look like that do this? And I'm, I'm just going to give you a sketch here and I'll tell you a little bit more about them tomorrow. There's explicit methods and there's implicit methods that to take uh, to solve them. Explicit methods are easier to parallelize, but you have to take tiny time steps. Implicit methods let you take big time steps, which is good, but they're harder to parallelize at each step. And then finally, when you do uh, eigenvalue problems to see if the building's going to fall down, then they use sort of the same building blocks, but I won't go into the details. So here on one slide is a numerical analysis course. Just to, just to, to get to the two red lines, the two red lines are the kernels that we need to parallelize. 
And so if our differential equation is x dot equals a times x, where a is a big sparse matrix, what are we going to do? We're only going to solve it at certain time steps. So I don't want to compute the solution at every time step. I'll just do it at time t equal dt, 2 times dt, 3 times dt. And so what, how do I do that? Well, the differential equation tells me the slope of the solution. So I'm going to use the formula, very simple. To get the solution at step i plus 1, I'll take the previous one plus time step times the slope, right? Simple, approximated by a straight line. So I've got to decide, where am I going to get the slope? This formula gives me the slope. It's a times x. But am I going to get the slope at the beginning, at the left end of that line segment? That would be a times x. Or am I going to get it at the other end of the line segment? One approach gives you an explicit method. Here is the one line formula for the whole thing. All I have to do is a sparse matrix vector multiply. That's what I have to parallelize. And there's an enormous amount of cleverness to do that well, which I'll get to tomorrow. Now, if I choose to compute the slope at the other end point, at i plus 1, what do I have to do? I have to solve a system of linear equations to get from time step i to time step i plus 1, a sparse system of linear equations. And again, there's a huge number of different ways to go about doing that. But those are the two uh, uh, patterns that come up over and over again for which many libraries exist, which you should consider a solved problem, perhaps, if you're an applied person, and, and which, but I'll tell you some more about open research questions in them tomorrow. Okay, and modes of vibration, it's sort of the same thing. So that's all I wanted to say about ODEs. And uh, so are there any questions before I get to the very last pattern? Okay, where everything is continuous, partial differential equations. And here, this is like the most detailed kind of models that people would build to describe a physical simulation. They come in different flavors, electrostatics, gravity. In that case, your function that you're trying to compute is the potential. The gravitational potential or electrostatic potential is a function of where you are. There's no time dependence, but it depends on everything in space. Everybody depends on everybody, as I was telling you before. You also have things like wave problems, sound waves, water waves. In that case, you're trying to solve for the pressure at every point. That depends not just on where you are, but it depends on the time. It's a function of time. There are different algorithms for that. And finally, there's something that's sort of in between. They're called parabolic problems. They depend on time. The temperature depends on time, or the concentration depends on time. But the difference between wave problems and these kind of problems is that if it's a wave, information can't move faster than the wave speed, right? Nothing can move faster than the speed of light in a fluid. Nothing can move faster than however fast the fluid, you know, sound can move through the fluid. And so information can't travel very far, and you have much better locality. So the algorithms are different. But if you're talking about heat or diffusion, and you look at the equation, everybody depends on everybody again. And so we have that challenge we had before of parallelization, where everybody depends on everybody. And of course, in the real world, if you're doing fluids or elasticity, you get a big hairy differential equation. It has both terms in it. So you might have to use all the patterns to solve one differential equation. And so let me go to uh, the simplest example I can think of to illustrate it. And in fact, the first person who wrote down the solution for this was Fourier a long time ago. And he invented the Fourier transform to solve the heat equation in, in, his, first, in his book on, on heat. And so here's a bar. It's glowing red hot at one end. It's ice cold blue at the other end. And I want to know what the temperature is in between, you know, as I vary you know, the heat, the temperature at both ends. And so u is the temperature, is a function of the position and the time. And here is the heat equation that Fourier wrote down a few hundred years ago. And so the, it turns out, no surprise, that the techniques we're going to use to discretize it are write down slopes, approximations, just as we did for an ordinary differential equation. Except now, of course, I have two variables I have to do it for. I have both x, so I'll have, I'm going to approximate things at x in, times, in, in space steps of h, so h, 2h, 3h. And I'm going to do time steps at t, uh, delta, 2 delta, 3 delta. And so I'm going to have a two-dimensional mesh on which I'm trying to get my solution. What's the temperature? And so when I make these approximations, I get a system of linear equations to solve to go from time step i to time step i plus 1. And I have to solve a system of linear equations. And here is, and, but it's always the same system of linear equations. It's this matrix with twos down the diagonal, negative ones in the off diagonal. It's called the Laplacian, right? It's a famous matrix. And we're just going to solve this linear system over and over again to get from one time step to the next. So this is the simplest thing you could do to solve a heat equation, one dimension, one dimensional bar. And it's really easy, because it's, it's just one dimensional. 
But of course, we want to solve things that are two-dimensional or three-dimensional. In that case, the obvious algorithm that you learned in freshman linear algebra, Gaussian elimination, it's not good enough. The matrix is going to look like this. Now, every row has five non-zeros in it because I have a number for my particular value and, I ha and it depends on all my four neighbors. So I have four values in my row for my north, south, east, and west neighbors. And this is the system of linear equations with this matrix that I have to solve. And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. And so let me just give you a little tour of the different ways. I'm not going to tell you how to implement them all. But depending on how much of the special structure of this matrix you exploit, there's an enormous range of costs. So what I'm going to do is give you just a list of the algorithm, what it, how many steps it takes as a function of n if you run it in a serial machine, if you run it, how many steps it takes on a parallel machine where communication is free, you know, a bit of a lie, but it's an approximation, how much memory it takes, and how many processors it takes to run as fast as possible. So if you ignore all the structure in the matrix and don't pay any attention to the fact that most of the entries are zero, Gaussian elimination, you know, well understood, it costs you n cubed, this is the slowest thing you could do. Then you could say to yourself, well, all these guys out here are zeros, excuse me, this is a banded matrix, why don't I just not bother storing all these zeros and just work on the stuff between that diagonal and that diagonal? That's another well-known algorithm, it's called band Gaussian elimination, and it gets you down from n cubed to n squared, right? That's a big win, but there's still a lot of structure we haven't taken advantage of. So these are, are patterns to recognize, right? I'm just going to apply them all to Laplace's equation. And, uh, but if you don't have Laplace's equation, you might want to use one of these other algorithms. Then you could say to yourself, well, I don't want to use that much memory. N of the three halves is too much memory. I want to use as little memory as possible. And there's another algorithm that all I ever have to do is multiply by that matrix I showed you in the previous page. It's called Jacobi's method. It's still going to go slowly, but the memory has gone down significantly. So that's worth doing. So then you could say to yourself, well, I'm going to solve, I'm going to take a lot of time steps. Why don't I just compute the inverse once and for all, store it, and just multiply by it? Wouldn't that be cheaper, right? So just store the explicit inverse. That doesn't help you at all. It's a bad idea. Because the explicit inverse costs you n squared to multiply by it. Not a good idea. And the memory is terrible, because it all fills up. It's not sparse anymore. Then you could say to yourself, well, oh, here's some more mathematical properties. The matrix is not only you know, sparse, but it has this property called symmetric, it, you know, A equals A transpose and positive definite. If you know what that is, fine. If not, that's OK. If you take advantage of all those properties and you say, all I'm going to do is matrix multiply by it, the cost goes down from n squared to n to the 3 halves. That's a big win. Uh, there is another algorithm I'll mention in passing that also takes advantage of the same properties goes a tiny bit faster in, in parallel. The log n term goes away. It turns out you can implement Gaussian elimination on that matrix and take advantage of all the zeros much more cleverly. It's called sparse Gaussian elimination. But it doesn't improve things terribly much. But, uh, but it would work for matrices even that don't have fours and minus ones in it. It works much more generally. Finally, we, t we go back to Fourier and we recognize we can use the fast Fourier transform. And the cost goes from n to the 3 halves to almost optimal n log n. I mean, how big is the output? The output is of size n, right? There are n answers. I can't do it faster than n. I'm pretty close. n log n. And finally, if I take advantage of every last piece of mathematics, there's an algorithm called multigrid, and I can do it in n steps. And that's the size of the output. And so what could be better than that? So the reason I went through all this is that every line in this table is a useful algorithm. People use it. It depends on how much structure you have, which pattern applies. And you know, I'm not going to pretend to teach you all the mathematics that you need to do it, but if you want to learn more, I'm teaching numerical linear algebra this semester, and you could learn all about it. And one more slide, if you go from 2D to 3D, it changes slightly. And I just put in red what happens in three dimensions. So, but that's enough detail there. Okay, so let me, I'm almost done. Let me come back and say that here are all the algorithms I had in the previous slide, all the way from dense Gaussian elimination all the way down to multigrid. And the question is, how do we go implement them, right? I'm not going to talk about that today. That's tomorrow. All those motifs come up. I mean, dense Gaussian elimination, that's dense linear algebra. There, there's no, you know, that, that's obvious. But some of the other algorithms are actually the other motifs I mentioned, operations on structured meshes, operations in unstructured meshes, and FFTs, well, that was the spectral motif. So all of those are going to come up 
and we're going to talk about how to make them run fast tomorrow. So one last example to show you um, just what real sparse matrices look like that people want to solve in practice. And this isn't quite real. So this is a, you know, a, a, an example that you, that you can call up in MATLAB if you want to see it. It's a sparse matrix that comes from simulating the airflow over a wing. And so every, there's a non-zero in the matrix for every vertex in this graph. And, um, and so this is what it looks like. And so you can see that there's lots and lots of mesh points around near the surface of the wing where you want to very finely refine the value, compute the pressures and velocities. And this is what the matrix looks like. And if you do Gaussian elimination, it fills in. Uh, but it doesn't fill in very much. That's something we want to take advantage of. And, and finally, let me just go on to one example, which is actually a Parlab, which was one of the motivating examples for Parlab. It's a biomedical uh, example. And the goal is to understand why some people with osteoporosis are more susceptible to breaking their bones than others. And so the goal is to have a very detailed mathematical model of the strength of a bone and to be able to predict ahead of time whether this patient needs to have certain treatment or not. So the way this research began was a bone was taken from a cadaver. So we can analyze it in as much detail as you want. It was put into a tom uh, tomography device and a complete 3D model of that bone was extracted at 22 micron resolution. So every last little piece of the it's very porous bone was extracted. This is the image. And a model was made of every last piece of bone. This is kind of a picture of the matrix. Uh, you know, every little piece of bone was connected to another piece of bone, and there was you know, spring constants and all that put in there. And it was a matrix of dimension half a billion that described the uh, properties of this bone. And so what they did was they said, OK, here's a model of the bone. I, let me use that to say, if I press on it, when will it break? How hard do I have to press on it for it to break? They did that experiment. They took the real bone in the laboratory, and they tried to crunch it, and it broke at the same time. So their model actually captured the exact behavior of the bone. Now, the thing about solving a system of half a billion degrees of freedom is that um, you can only do it on a supercomputer. It's not going to go in every hospital in the country. And also, you have to be able to take the, the bone out and put it into this high radiation device in order to get this image. So it, this, this was the first part. So it turns out that since then, my colleague who did this work, who's a collaborator here on the PAR lab, has discovered you can use you know, regular CAT scans of patients. You, know, you don't have to take out the bones to do it. It's a much smaller matrix, but it's still large enough that you need parallelism. And he is successfully predicting uh, whether bones will break with much higher accuracy than the usual bone density mechanism that people use. And so he is now you know, trying to commercialize this. What can I say? It's, a, it's an interesting application of high performance computing and all this linear system stuff to, uh, to you know, important medical problems. And let me uh, just summarize. This is my last slide. I've talked about load balancing. We'll talk about it a little bit more. This came up all over the place. How do you, you know, assign work to different processors? I talked about graph partitioning. Um, that's going to come up when we do sparse matrix vector multiply. It's the same problem. Linear algebra came up all over the time. And also these fast particle methods, where we lowered the cost to uh, n log n instead of n squared. And so uh, I hope this is, you know, giving you a sense of what patterns arise, not how to implement them. Um, if all you're interested in is solving your problems and you recognize one of these patterns, your first step should be to say, which library should I use? Who has solved this for me? Where can I go get the existing good solution? Tomorrow I will go into some more detail, but also some of the open problems that we're still working on to make these things run fast. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. I think I'm right on time. Are there any questions while I hope the next speaker is here? Yes. Oh, yes. And um, uh, we work on those. And depending on how much accuracy you want, there's a, there's a whole range. And, and whether you want just the singular values or the singular vectors as well, there's a whole range of different ones. And one of the teaching assistants, actually, uh, Michael Anderson, and I are working on this on GPUs. And the application where it comes up is real-time video surveillance. So there's a very nice algorithm by Manuel, uh, Emmanuel Candez at Stanford, where it will take a sequence of images from a, a video camera uh, and automatically separate it into the stationary background and the people who are walking, moving in front. And it's, and it's the inner loop requires a singular value decomposition. That's the bottleneck. 
of a matrix uh, where there's one row for every pixel and there's one column for every image in your, in your video sequence. And so we have that now running in, in real time. And so we can actually do real time video surveillance. And I'm hoping this is, no, it's not the next speaker. Okay. Um, so, and, and so we can tell you about that in, in much more detail. So we have a whole range of different algorithms. Oh, th this is specifically for dense matrices. So if you want to do it for sparse, then we have sparse matrix techniques, which, and I will talk about this briefly tomorrow, or we can do it offline, that will, uh, you know, so we have both, both flavors. So in the sparse case, the uh, bottleneck is sparse matrix vector multiply, and those, that's typically used when you only want a few of the largest or a few of the smallest singular values. And if you, but if you want all of them, then you typically use dense techniques. Yes. And Kurt Kreutzer is going to talk about that this afternoon. And um, so um, I had a slide on, on my lecture yesterday where there was this thing called our, our pattern language. And it, it, it started by the, it, the, it, the development was were the originally the seven dwarfs. And let me just go back to the very beginning here. I think I had that. So these were the original seven. Those are part of the pattern language. Those are the computational patterns. And then, in addition to those, there are all these new structural patterns, uh, which, which are not computation, but they're how you glue together parallel programs out of other uh, pieces, these and, and others. And there's a whole lecture today on that that Kurt Kreutzer is going to give. So stay tuned. Is Kathy here yet? Okay, we might take a look. I'm happy to keep answering questions until our next speaker gets here. She, she knows she's supposed to be here. Oh, you want to come and set up? Great. Yes, please. So, so Kurt is a good person to ask. We've had a lot of visitors. So, so let me say that the, the big connection to finance is something called the Black-Scholes equations. That's sort of the best known partial differential equation which won a Nobel Prize to describe the prices of derivatives. And we've had meetings with those folks to, you know, to talk about whether to do that. Um, talk about being proprietary about intellectual property. Those people, <laughs> they, they will give us toy problems to look at. Um, there's, there's a whole group of folks here who are trying to start a computational finance program who know a great deal about those. And we've begun to talk to them to, to do this. Um, and again, I'm going to uh, put that off to Kurt uh, because he's had the most conversations with those folks.